Um, hello and welcome to the launch of our Essex Health series. Uh, we're really pleased to offer a number of sessions aiming to improve people's uh, knowledge and on the impact of COVID and its knock-on effects to people's health and well-being. We're really keen to look at highlighting how physical activity can play a, a really important role in supporting this. So this morning's webinar is looking at understanding COVID recovery. Um, I'm delighted that we're joined by Dr. William Bird, CEO and founder of Intelligent Health, and Ruth Barlow, respiratory lead for Provide. Now, before we uh, get started, I, I just wanted to run through how we're gonna run today's session. Uh, we're going to kick off in a moment with a, a couple of polls just to, to get some information um, from yourselves. Uh, we'll then hear from Dr. Bird, followed by Ruth, and then we've uh, got a Q&A section um, towards the end. Please use the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen to pose any questions. A couple of my colleagues will be monitoring that and we'll use that to pose those questions uh, to William and Ruth once we get to the Q&A section. The chat function is also available um, should you wish to use that, but please ensure that any questions go into the, the Q&A section. Uh, finally, the webinar is being recorded and so will be available um, at a later date and we'll let you know where that link is via email. And so let's get cracking and if we can have our first poll up, please Mel. So hopefully on your screen now you should have a, um, a pop-up, which we're just looking at how would you rate your current understanding of COVID recovery? One being poor and five being excellent. Hopefully you should be able to select one of those on your screen and then it should disappear. Brilliant. So thank you for that. We've got 85% of people voted so far and up to 95%. So brilliant. We'll close that one now and move on to our second poll. And so this one is ju just to give us an idea of how you're feeling as an individual about how you've coped with lockdown. Brilliant, so a couple more seconds just on that one, we're at 96%. And then, Mel, if you can share the results of this one, please. Okay, so we've, we've got a bit of a mix, but the majority of, of people, participants on the call today then are, are sort of somewhere in the middle to good, which is, which is great to hear, but obviously appreciate um, everybody's got very different circumstances and actually work life, home life, et cetera, is all going to have played a, a, a massive impact on that. But that's just really useful um, for, for us and, and for William and Ruth to, to help support how they're going to pitch their delivery today. Thank you, Mel. Um, so just leaves me to say thank you. In, hopefully you'll enjoy today's session. Um, and now I'd like to welcome and hand over to Dr. William Bird for the first part of the seminar. That's brilliant. Thanks very much. And, uh, and it's a real pleasure um, to be here. And I'm just going to um, share my screen. So hopefully, um, it hasn't got a red ring. Can you see that at all? Is that Yes, that's shared? up. It's up, yeah. it's just not in slideshow mode. It will be in a minute. <laughs> there Brilliant. We go. That's fine. So, um, yeah, a real pleasure to be here. So I'm William Bird, I'm a GP, and I'm actually not in the local area, I'm in um, Reading, but I've been working with Essex um, LDP in the, um, getting the 
physical activity embedded in that system change um, for about four years now, working with um, Jason and the council in how physical activity should be totally integrated right from top to bottom. And it's been a real fascinating journey sponsored by Sport England, um, who are really putting a lot of investment into it. Um, and just when I did that poll, the first one, it said, how much do you know about recovery um, from COVID, et cetera? And I put excellent because I saw Ruth's slides last night. So I had a preview of, of it and they're really good. So I learned a lot from that. So you'll enjoy that after I've um, finished. So really what I wanted to do to start with is to look at how physical activity impacts COVID, but in particular, the immunity, because we know all about physical activity and how it's good for you. But what perhaps we don't quite understand is how that interacts with our immune system and how that impacts with COVID as well. So I'm going to go back to the basics. And this is a kind of principle I've followed the whole time. We are geared up as human beings as being hunter-gatherers and hunter-gatherers are, are social animals. So people is really important, people around us the place where we are. So nature is incredibly important in, in the wiring of our brain that when we are in outdoor mode, we tend to have all sorts of changes in the body to help us to be more relaxed. Our parasympathetic nervous system increases, our sympathetic nervous system goes down. Therefore, we replenish ourselves and lots of evidence on that. And we have a purpose. We know what we're doing. We know why we're here. We know who we are. And we have some control over life. And those five ways to well-being that came out of connect, of take notice, be active and keep learning, all fitted into this wonderful place. And then along came COVID. And suddenly that social aspect all became loneliness. The outdoors became indoors. And that kind of control of purpose autonomy became lack of purpose and lack of control. Um, and that is lockdown. So a huge change from what we're designed to be to this. And of course, what does our body say? We don't like it. Um, and actually it starts to stimulate parts of our brain which are worried that we are not gonna get our food. We're not we're gonna not find our shelter as hunter gatherers. So we start to create the fear from the amygdala in the back of the brain and chronic stress, which is one of the key problems of the 21st century, but particularly during this time of lockdown. And that chronic stress and loneliness changes all our behaviors to become inactivity, poor diet, obesity, and smoking. Um, in fact, evidence, really strong evidence, shows that when you're chronically stressed, and that stress is not the stress of a, when you're going out to give a talk or you're about to get an exam result or you're going for an interview, that stress is the stress you wake up with and you go to bed with. It's the stress of, about money. It's the stress about fear of crime. It's the stress about perhaps living in a, in a fairly destructive relationship. It's the stress of worrying about your children. That chronic stress when you're out of control eats away at us and what it does, it reduces, in act, it reduces our activity because activity, you have to be really well um, emotionally vibrant in order to get the activity because on the hierarchy of needs, it's actually not as important as survival. So our bodies calm down and it also saves calories. If you're going through starvation as a hunter gatherer, being inactive is not a bad thing in saving those calories. So when we're stressed, it's really hard to get people to become active. In fact, I'd say it's almost impossible for someone to sustain physical activity under chronic stress in normal situations. And likewise, when you're chronically stressed, what do you do? You try and get calories in. Because in the past, as hunter gatherers, what were we doing when we were um, you know, getting stressed? It was probably because there wasn't food going to come around. So we, we release a hormone called ghrelin. That goes to the brain, tells us to eat lots, and then we get obesity and fat. So that is a stress reaction. So we've got this stress, stress hormones, inactivity, poor diet, obesity, and smoking. And that goes to what happens then is the immune system starts to get excited and starts to attack our own body. And that's called chronic inflammation. It's very subtle, but as we can see, it's all of these conditions are related to chronic inflammation, which we can tell in children who are under overweight and who've got inactivity as young as six. So once you start to get that chronic inflammation, the first one we discovered 15, 20 years ago now was cardiovascular disease. So heart disease was not just cholesterol coming along, it was an inflammatory response that created 
these plaques, etc. So I'm going to then at the end talk about how that chronic inflammation impacts on COVID and how we can fight off COVID and if we get COVID how it imp imposes on the COVID reaction in our immune system. But before I get there, let's have a look and see how physical activity reduces this chronic inflammation, how it affects our immune system. So the first one is the thing that's often forgotten when we're talking about the immune system is visceral fat. You know, there's a slide I put up many times about fat is deep inside, that's not visceral fat, that's subcutaneous fat, but inside, underneath that, is probably gonna be one of those big white blobs. Um, so you've got the ring around the outside of white or blue here, and that's the subcutaneous fat, and inside you've got the visceral fat. Now, why visceral fat is so important is because it's got huge amount of cytokines, and cytokines are um, parts of the immune system which are quite destructive, and they really do start to eat away at cells, hopefully bad cells, cells that are infected. But as we can see, that changes to good cells as well. And it's a massive storehouse of of these cytokines, the immune system is fighting against the visceral fat. It's really poisonous stuff. We're not designed to have it very long. But as we saw earlier, when you get ghrelin, you store your fat for a rainy day. So when you're stressed or you feel there's you know, some problem coming along, you keep that fat and it's very, very accessible, very quick to come out. And it's put in the middle of the stomach. It's not meant to be there for very long, probably a few weeks or months. And then it's a storage will get used up. Of course, for us, it goes on forever and ever. But that is a toxic fat of huge amounts of white cells, lymphocytes, B cells, T cells, all fighting and causing chaos. And you might think it's a little bit of blob of fat. It's not, it's actually more destructive. And when you walk fast for 60 minutes a day and don't lose any weight, you will still lose visceral fat before anything else. So that's why physical activity is the most important thing to try and getting rid of visceral fat. It may not change your weight, as we can see here on its own, but inside where you can't see it, you're losing that visceral fat. So don't worry if patients or, or clients come to you and say, oh, I've been doing all this exercise, I'm not losing weight. It doesn't matter as long as they're doing the exercise and as long as they're doing it every day and as long as they're doing it for at least 30 minutes or here 60 minutes a day, they will be losing visceral fat, but it will be invisible. But if we could look inside them, we'd see a big shift. And that has an incredible impact on their health and particularly this inflammation that we saw. The other thing is these myokines, which are like cytokines are going around, but they're good ones. These are ones that are actually called, these, um, these myokines are anti-inflammatory. So they reduce that chronic inflammation just by exercising those muscles. And so that's why the strengthening of muscles is so important. And I understand you're going to talk about it next week. Um, we, um, you know, it's now put right at the top of the guidance for physical activity above aerobic activity, that the strengthening exercises are really important. So the, one of the reasons is that muscle bulk is really good for protection of the body, but it also has an impact on reduce, releasing these myokines, which go around and calm down all the immune system, which is unnecessarily causing damage to the body, right from the Alzheimer's in the brain, down to the um, heart disease, down to the um, gut as well. So that's why extending your muscles and keeping those muscles really active is important. And then finally, in every cell, you've got the mitochondria. And in the mitochondria, if you've got a pretty sedentary life, you're eating all the rubbish things which we've told, we've seen during lockdown and during stress, we're sitting there, we're stressed, and we've got high calorie diet. Then these poor mitochondria, which the batteries in every cell, they charge themselves up because they're ready to do lots and lots of activity, but they've got nothing to do because you're sitting there with a big pizza and watching television and doing nothing and stressed out of your mind. And therefore those mitochondria start to leak electrons because they can't hold it in anymore. It's their old kind of thing like when you had a mobile phone, you used to charge them up in the old days before they cut out and it got warm. In fact, when you overcharge a battery, it will get warm and it gets warm because electrons are leaking out of that battery because it can't hold the charge anymore. It's like a big dam which leaking little bits of water coming out. Same with your mitochondria. You've got 35 to 50 in every cell, sometimes more. And those mitochondria, when they charge up in the inner and outer membrane, now it's all charged. It can't hold it forever. 
And so you leak out these free radicals as they're more kind of colloquially known, but they are electrons, in fact, um, and they're all reactive oxidative species, if you want to be posh. Then these things come out and they are the real damage causing so, so many problems, pretty much all problems of the 21st century diseases that we get of diabetes and obesity and dementia and other things like that. So as soon as you start to become active, of course, those don't need to come out anymore because now that in, um, around the ring, around the mitochondria, that's calmed down. And as soon as you become active, you stop producing these free radicals. And these free radicals hit the end of the telomeres and they cause problems there. But the, their biggest thing is that they're causing chronic inflammation. Now, just on the, the telomeres here, this is a chromosome at the end of a chromosome is a telomere. That telomere gets shorter every time a cell divides until eventually there's no more telomere left. And that's when a cell stops dividing. And that's when you start to get aging because that cell disappears. If those telomeres get shortened artificially because these free radicals are knocking them off, then you're going to age more quickly. But not only that, you're going to, that cell is going to go into what's called senescence. And when it goes into senescence, it actually generates lots of chronic inflammation. So we're back again to this chronic inflammation, um, which is so damaging. Interestingly, if a client comes to you or a patient comes to you, say, so what's best, doc? Is it best to exercise in the gym? Or is it best to exercise outdoors? Well, green exercise, when they measure the telomeres at the end of the chromosome and the telomerase, which is the hormone which actually lengthens those telomeres, so physical activity is the only thing which definitely anti-ages people. It's the anti-aging miracle. Green exercise does that far better than indoor gym exercise. So there we go. Both do lots and lots of good. Both are you know, great for the body, but possibly because of the reduced stress, that parasympathetic or some other factors, it seems to have a better anti-aging than when you're outdoors. And obviously with that, with it's other people as well, that's always a good thing. So that's just something to think about. So we've got this new disease of chronic inflammation. So how does that impact when we come to COVID? So here we go, here is a COVID virus with its little spikes that we know about so well. And those spikes are the ones that have got most of the mutations. Interestingly, a lot of the vaccines now are gonna be looking at the inner part, that big ball part of the virus, which is a nucleic capsoid, um, because that doesn't mutate so much. And if they can get an antibody, anti, sorry, if they get a um, vaccination against that inner part, then it's gonna be a lot more stable compared to the outer spikes which seem to have much more of the mutation side of it. And that's where all the vaccines are focusing on at the moment. Um, you can see those little kind of funny gray things. They're the ACE2 inhibitor, the ACE2 receptors on a cell of which this virus locks onto. And the mutations from South Africa and Brazil have got a better stickiness of the virus onto those ACE2 receptors, making sure that virus goes there. So here we are. We're in COVID land now. So how does all that, what I've just talked about, apply? Well, first of all, what's lockdown done? This is, ever, this is um, some data which I'm cheekily presenting to you before it's published, um, because the government's about to publish some of this stuff. So please don't <laughs> send this, I'll be sacked. But 43% of people with long-term health condition are unable to walk as far as before compared to 13% of the people without a long-term health condition. So you can see here that people with um, long-term health conditions are now considerably more affected by COVID and lockdown compared to those who've got, not got a long-term health condition because they were shielding. That's a huge difference. 43% unable to walk as far. We've got this pandemic of deconditioning occurring. And from disadvantaged social backgrounds, again, almost double, not quite, but almost double the number of people um, who are saying they're less steady on their feet compared to those from the most advantaged. So not only have we got a big deconditioning pandemic coming along, but we've also got a big problem um, where we've got problems with the long-term conditions being much worse and people from socioeconomic backgrounds being worse as well. So 
that is one of the big problems with our seeing this widening of health inequalities. In Essex, we've got 19,000 people who are now less active because of the start of lockdown three. So lockdown three, um, so I'm gonna put myself on there. Um, lockdown three was the one that is now between December and February. And you can see how that level has gone down in, in the dark purple um, and affecting a lot of people, particularly lower socioeconomic, as we've seen, long health term health conditions, as we've seen, but also women and those in the, the younger age group. So this lockdown one didn't really do much. People were actually a little bit more euphoric. They got outdoors, it was a beautiful spring, and then lockdown two had this slightly increasing effect. But of course, physical activity levels do go down in December anyway. But what's happened is they've continued to go down, um, which has been one of the biggest problems here. So we have a problem of lockdown, but when you've got inactivity and people not doing any activity, then the natural killer cells, which are the first line of defense in the nose and the lining of the lung, which attack the viruses, they are actually reduced as well. So every time you go for a walk, a fast walk, it will increase your natural killer cells, part of the innate immune system. And that will help fight off the virus before it gets a chance to get into the body. So that's why physical activity is so important during a pandemic is not only to keep yourself fit and keep your lungs and your heart and all of that part of you active, but actually to also make sure your immune system is in better shape. You've heard about the cytokine storm. That is the killer, really, for COVID. People seem to do quite well in the first um, seven to 10 days, and then suddenly they deteriorate. You know, Boris Johnson, classic example, seven days, feeling a bit miserable, sitting then suddenly, his oxygen level started to drop and he started to become a lot more ill and it's due to a shift in the immune system. So what's happening on the left hand side, you can see active immune cells giving out cytokines but targeting it to infected cells. With the cytokine storm, you've got many more immune cells targeting everything. They're not even targeting, they're hitting your healthy cells as well as the diseased cells. So it stops that discretion between, you know, discrimination between different cells. And the big bit of news that's come out, and this, journal, this came out just published at the end of last year, was those people with this chronic inflammation that we've talked about, which goes all the way back, were far more likely to get the cytokine storm. So obesity, heard it today, it came on the news today. Why is obesity? It's not surprising. Obesity has got vast amounts of activity going on causing chronic inflammation. Therefore, people with chronic inflammation are going to get cytokine storms. So that's why it is, and I don't think there's any particular kind of, you know, difficulty in understanding that. So if we go through everything I've just said, hopefully it will make sense. And then we can talk to, and um, we'll get Ruth to say the parts about long COVID, um, which is really fascinating. So we've got the people, place and purpose going wrong because of lockdown and the stressing events of what we're hearing on the news all the time is leading to this chronic stress. And because we've got this weak resilience of the people, purpose, place going wrong, then chronic stress is going to be a problem. Um, that leads to addictions, inactivity, poor diet and poor sleep. We haven't talked about addictions and sleep, but certainly alcohol has become a problem and sleep is a problem. Um, and that leads to a disruptive immune system. So the effects of lockdown are all about the people, place, purpose, place. So you're now getting people outdoors, not outdoors, much more indoors, lonely and no value and scared. You've got chronic stress developing and you've got these poor health behaviors. And that affects the immune system, not only to prevent you getting from COVID, but also if you do get it, it's gonna if you get it wrong, it's gonna increase the risk of getting a cytokine storm. So that's why it's so important. When we talk about physical activity, you can see it's one little part there, but it's all linked together with getting people to try and be outdoors as much as you can, helping their stress, helping their effects on that. Um, and hopefully we will stop that weak immune system. Thanks very much, Simon.
Brilliant. Thank you for that, William. That's re really good and really informative. Um, as William said, uh, we'll now hand over to Ruth, who is going to do her piece on long COVID and recovery. And then please keep putting any questions you have in the question box. Um, and my colleagues will pose those to William and Ruth after Ruth's uh, presentation. So over to you, Ruth. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll just share my screen. And can you see that okay? Yeah, that's all there, thank you. Lovely. Um, so um, yeah, my name's Ruth Barlow. Um, I work um, as the respiratory lead in Mid-Essex um, and um, I've been working uh, with uh, COVID patients. So with um, the leading on the long COVID clinic and also COVID rehab. So, um, Firstly, I'd say if you come across somebody who has COVID, I'd direct them to the website, the, the NHS website, Your Recovery, Recovery, um, because it's got a, a lot of information there and covers all the different aspects of, of symptoms that the patient might have. Um, so just considering what is long COVID, um, and obviously this has not been around for very long, so we're learning it as we're going. Um, but um, uh, long COVID has lots of signs and symptoms, um, but you need to, uh, by definition, have had those signs and symptoms for more than 12 weeks to be recorded as having long COVID. Um, also in the long COVID clinic, we're having a few issues um, trying to work out who actually has long COVID, whether the patient has had COVID in the first place. And bearing in mind in um, March, April time, uh, there weren't that many uh, tests being offered. So um, a lot of patients weren't actually, uh, um, they haven't got evidence that they had COVID. Um, but the symptoms I would look for is that initial um, uh, episode of being unwell. Um, and then um, this uh, feeling of fatigue persists. So if you come across somebody who is fatigue, has had fatigue for months, then it is worth considering whether they might have had long COVID. They also have a battery of other symptoms. So um, pain, um, mental health problems from anxiety to depression, um, because um, often they don't have a, a diagnosis. They've been sent to a neurologist, a rheumatologist, you know, all around to different um, uh, experts and still may, might not be getting a, a definitive diagnosis. Um, so it's not that easy to diagnose. If, if they've had that positive test or had um, antibodies, then it's that little bit easier. And bearing in mind that people who've been really sick are no more risk than somebody who's had a mild illness. So again, it's quite difficult to work out who has long COVID. So chronic fatigue um, has been around for some time. Um, so um, we know uh, chronic fatigue syndrome um, is uh, described by extreme tiredness. Um, and it, you might also know it as ME, myalgic encephalomyelitis. Um, it was in the past known as yuppie flu, um, but um, and not everyone recognises it, but I think most people now feel it is a real condition. Um, and there's lots of parallels between that and long COVID. So it can affect anyone, um, including children, but it tends to be more women. And we're seeing the long COVID patients tend to be more women than men. And bearing in mind, the men are the ones that tended to end up in hospital sicker. Um, and um, it tends to be the younger people, and I'm seeing that as well in the long COVID clinic. Um, so it's been recognised long before long COVID. And treatment for chronic fatigue has been a structured, ex structured exercise programme with graded exercise. So that is how most of us would get patients to exercise or people to exercise at the gym or what have you, uh, gradually increasing what they're doing. 
Um, but there are nice guidelines that are being reviewed at the moment and they are um, moving away from graded exercise to talk about exercise envelopes. So episodes of exercise um, rather than graded exercise. And bearing in mind, if you see somebody who has long COVID, they might be able to do um, a long walk with you or a session at the gym or um, uh, push themselves a bit. But the next day or the next three days, et cetera, they might then have to be in bed. So not pushing them is really important. And treatment for long COVID, um, anything that can be treated, so medication for pain, et cetera, should be treated. CBT is used a lot, so an alternative way of thinking of things, uh, talking therapy. We, we know people who have the same long-term condition and have a completely different lifestyle and quality of life, and that's often due to their attitude. So if they've got a, a positive attitude and they can uh, problem solve a lot, then they tend to have a better life, uh, quality of life than somebody who everything gets on top of them and uh, they won't go out and exercise, for instance. So most people with chronic fatigue will improve over time, um, but some don't make a full recovery. And for long COVID, the nearest parallel we have is uh, SARS. And, and for those patients, we saw that they did improve um, pretty much over a year. I'm seeing people who are nearly a year on and have made a small recovery, but not a big recovery. So I, I suspect that people with long COVID will take longer. Um, and they take two steps forward, three steps backwards. That's not unusual, but obviously it's quite um, depressing or you know, it's not good for a patient to feel like they, they're getting worse at times. Um, and the younger people tend to recover completely compared to the older people for chronic fatigue. Whether that happens with long COVID or not, we don't know. So um, part of what I'll uh, talk to with the pe people with long COVID is the type of fatigue they might have. So lots of people are aware that uh, physical energy will, is likely to increase your fatigue, but people are less aware that um, mental effort, social and um, emotional efforts can in increase people's fatigue. So we give them a lot of information about that and trying to um, break their activities into um, uh, different areas. So not do all their physical activities in the morning, but sp space them out with some social, some mental, etc. And also seeing that time on a screen is can fatigue you. So um, sleep tends to be a problem with patients with long COVID and we just direct them to um, support with their sleep. So there's lots of information about um, how to improve your sleep or tips there. And they're on the COVID website as well. Um, and we talk about uh, their battery. So we say that um, uh, people have a smaller battery post COVID. Um, it, uh, it flattens more quickly post COVID and it takes a long time to recover. Um, but if they always have 30% left in their battery, they will recover more quickly than if they go down to zero. So always have a bit of energy left. And uh, we talk about boom and bust a lot. So uh, as I described, somebody who will push themselves um, to exercise or maybe complete a document or something, you know, so it could be a mental uh, fatigue they have, they will then um, have to rest for the rest of the day or, or next day. And plan, pace, plan and prioritise, which I'll talk about a bit more. Um, keep resting and charging it up. So um, I had somebody telling me that they did some gardening the other day, they spent an hour in the garden and then towards the end of the hour, they realized they were really shattered and they just had to go and have a sleep. So I suggested to him, he um, set himself an alarm after 30 minutes, just to sit down, have a cup of tea and then continue with the gardening. And then he found that he could do more by doing that. Um, so lots of little rest is good. Um, and that's 
uh, chunking setting limits, that's um, uh, making sure you rest when you're doing an activity. Um, having good sleep, um, diet and hydration, so making sure people have the fuel that they need to do their activities, they're eating regularly and they're drinking properly. <clears throat> and obviously exercise is important, um, but it has to be a gradual increase. And also trying to get them to do things that they enjoy, not just everything that they have to do. So avoiding the boom and bust, um, finding their baseline is helpful. So we use a lot of um, uh, activity diaries. So we get patients to record what they're doing on a weekly basis. And uh, they also record how much fatigue that's caused them and also how much enjoyment, just to say you should enjoy some things that you do. Um, and uh, we go through them one-to-one uh, -one and just point out. So uh, for instance, I had somebody who um, just worked um, was on his computer and then went to bed and that was every day apart from the weekend and uh, so when I went through it with him he realized that he he was no longer going for his walk at lunchtime because that's what he used to do uh, um, but now he's working from home he has just stopped doing that um, so just something little like that may it was a bit of a light bulb moment with him where he sort of thought, oh yes, I actually do need to get out. And he, he said it was months since he'd gone out of the house and he was a 24 year old. Um, so um, as William was saying about um, people staying at home be because they're shielding, uh, obviously they can still go out for a walk and uh, his slide showed in the summer, it's much more uh, likely patients would do that. But um, I think we're going to have a real issue with people who've been shielding and not done any exercise at all. Um, so uh, when we're looking at people with long COVID, they often think they can do more than they can. So we just get them to reduce their activity often by about 50% and then increase slowly from there and work on that. So make changes as they need. Um, and like I say, lots of little rest because fatigue um, is, quite manageable if you add in lots of little rests, you can do more if you do that. Um, and not pushing too much too quickly, um, no pain, no gain does not have any place with, with these types of people. Um, and um, on days where they are doing some uh, a lot um, and then doing inactivity, that's their boom and bust so really trying to avoid that because they can get more out of their body if they pace themselves more so pacing prioritizing and planning that's what we're encouraging the patients to do to take regular breaks to set an alarm break up the activity and then mix up your activities so seeing things um, as difficult different types of uh, fatigue, so it could be physical, it could be mental, etc. So breaking that up and not doing everything all in one go. So obviously exercise is really important for these people, um, but it's trying to find that baseline where they can increase and normally you have to get them to do less before they can do more. So start low and go slow, increase just by one activity or task or part of the task at, at a time. They have to go slowly or else they will um, have a setback. And some severe patients, they might increase by 10% over a week. Um, and um, obviously some people will get aches and pains when they're exercising. If they haven't exercised before, it's explaining that that's um, normal depending on what the pains are. Um, and emotions uh, are quite an issue for these patients, especially guilt. So they feel like they should be back to normal. They look OK. So um, they uh, feel they should push themselves. And then obviously they f then feel worse for it. They can feel guilty because they're, they're not um, uh, um, acting as a mother or father in their eyes. You know, like I've got somebody who's got a, a five year old and he said he can't play with him. He just um, just finds the noise from his child too much and he's sort of opted out a bit at the moment and obviously feeling guilty for that. 
So we're tending to use um, uh, access to psychological therapies a lot. So refer, referring on um, because people do tend to feel more anxious. Also, their memory is often affected, the concentration is affected, um, and they are worried that they're not going to get back to normal. Um, and they're often fearful that they'll get COVID again. Um, so a lot of these symptoms or feelings are normal for an illness, but with co long COVID, we're seeing it over a year. So obviously it does have an impact, as you heard William say about that long-term low level stress. So um, I started up the uh, rehab, um, COVID rehab. Now, bearing in mind, we have no evidence what we should be doing with these patients. We don't know um, what's the best uh, course of treatment for the patients. So I was lucky to get together a, a group of experts in the area and we came up with this program. And these are my outcome measures. We used the shuttle walking test. We used a quality of life questionnaire, anxiety and depression, uh, fatigue, breathless scale, and a satisfaction survey because we we're trying to pick up everything we, that we might pick up as a change. And these are the speakers we had. So we worked the, uh, or we ran the COVID rehab via Microsoft Teams. We saw the patient face to face for the walking test. Everything else was done via Microsoft Teams. And we had uh, speakers, um, the people attended four times a week. So with pulmonary rehab, which where we use the same sort of model, we do the exercise and education together twice a week. For COVID rehab, because of their fatigue, we split the education and the exercise talks. So they had exercise on a Monday, Friday and education on a Tuesday, Thursday. And these are the education talks. So we're very lucky to get really good speakers. Um, and Kim, who's some of these slides I've used, um, she's the fatigue consultant at Southend. Um, so uh, when I looked at their outcomes after um, rehab, um, I've just put up a slide here about their walking test results. So before rehab, they had an average walking test of 138 meters and after rehab, they increased to 231. So it's an increase of 93 meters, which is a massive increase for these people. Uh, we know that 45 meters is clinically significant. So they were way above the clinically significant change and um, they doubled it. Um, and when I compare that with my pulmonary rehab patients, so they're patients with respiratory conditions, COPD um, mostly, um, most of them will increase by 50 meters as an average. So it was a massive increase, much more than I expected. Um, and the other outcomes, uh, we didn't see any ho hospital admissions during the six week course. Um, the breathless, breathlessness scale improved. So we test their breathlessness at rest and uh, on exercise. And um, they both increased by a clinically significant amount. So clinically significant amount for breathlessness is one and they increased at rest by 1.7 or decrease because they actually uh, score lower to feel better. Um, and on exercise, it was 1.2. So it's a really good result for that as well. Um, and, you know, it's great to see that they felt less breathless having done the uh, rehab. We saw an improvement on the anxi anxiety. We didn't see a change in the depression, but we only found two patients that were depressed and one got better, one got worse. So um, these are small numbers as well. Um, the fatigue improved by a clinically significant amount and we had good satisfaction. Um, but I'm still to analyse the quality of life questionnaire because it's a bit more complicated. So I need a bit of help with that one. Um, and this is an email from a patient um, just saying uh, that he felt that the course was better, um, that it improved his stamina, breathlessness and fatigue. Um, and he put that down to the, to the course um, and felt that his breathing was better. So we got really good results from that. Um, but um, like I say, uh, it, it is a pilot, oh, I didn't say it's a pilot. We're hoping to get it commissioned. 
and uh, we'll have our second course of results to analyze um, this week, hopefully. And that's the end of my talk. So I'll just unshare. Brilliant. Uh, thank you, Ro. Thank you for that. That was really informative. Um, as I said, once we've now heard from uh, William and Ruth, uh, we'll now uh, have our Q&A session. So Kimberly, Kelly, could I ask you to um, just fire away with the questions? As I said before, please still use the q and I've seen lots of questions coming in, but still use that box if you've got any additional ones that you want to ask. And hopefully we've got about 15 minutes to try and get through as many as we can. Simon, I'll, I'll kick off. So first question is for William. Um, and the first question is based around green health, William. Um, and you spoke quite a lot in your presentation about benefits of um, being outdoors, um, certainly on people's mental well-being and, and activity levels. But does this relate to any, any outdoor activity, i.e. walking, exercise, gardening, etc.? Um, yes, so good question. So basically, any activity is better than no activity. So if you can't go outdoors, then it's much better to do indoor activity than do no activity. Um, so that's the first thing just to emphasize. But if you do go outside, one of the things about stress is that we get all completely consumed by thoughts and these negative thoughts start to impact on us. Um, so what we're thinking, what the thought is that when you go outdoors and you're doing green activities, your mind completely focuses on the things around you and your senses of listening to the birds singing or the trees rustling or you're looking at um act, you're looking at things which our brains really like so we really like nature and almost you're doing mindfulness you're starting to do this mindfulness and when you have mindfulness and physical activity together it's one of the most positive things for the body and that's how this telomeres are getting longer etc so anything really where you're in contact with either water or greenery around you it doesn't have to be amazing kind of big park land it can just be a small little tiny park or even a tree you're going to do as a destination where you you feel you're back in contact with that nature side even looking at the clouds and the, the sky can have an impact so all of this has been researched now around the world from the top universities showing the impact so anything that has a contact if you're outdoors in a street going down a road which is really busy that doesn't count unless you're looking up at the clouds you might just get a little bit of benefit, benefit there no so it really is trying to get into that mindfulness type of aspect. Brilliant, thank you, thank you, William. Um, the next question that we've had come in and actually both yourself and um, Ruth might want to, to come in on this, because um, you both spoke about the, the effects of lockdown and COVID on deconditioning, particularly for those individuals that have been shielding for sort of the past year. So going forwards, should we be looking at more strength-based training over more cardio-based um, forms of exercise? Um, I'll, I'll say a little bit and then I think Ruth will obviously you know, have a, quite a lot to say um, about it as well. So the guidance that came out from the um, four chief medical officers put strengthening exercises at the top. That was a big change above aerobic. So that was a massive kind of shift really because we forget about strengthening exercises. It's much harder to do. But what we're realizing now for deconditioning, it's the strengthening exercises that are probably the most important. Um, and there is this um, government little um, group together about the strength of the deconditioning pa pandemic, which I'm on. Um, and they meet this afternoon actually for the final report. And what they're saying is don't go, go straight out for a walk if you've been doing nothing for a year, because if you're in your 70s or 80s, the likelihood is you could fall and falls are obviously the biggest problem that we're gonna have. So try and get the strengthening exercises right first. And you may need some help as well if you're an older person. Now, I think that that is sort of certainly the episode. It doesn't mean we don't do the walking and the other things which are really important. The cardio is still very important going for a walk every day, but we forget about those strengthening. And as for depression, diabetes, and the immune system, getting strengthening of muscles is slightly ad more advantageous than cardio has been shown, particularly the depression side where you're doing a bit more vigorous activity, but also that strengthening. So it's become much more kind of high profile compared to where it was probably a few years ago. Um, and then probably Ruth have a much better idea about how to rehab with a rehab and also what you, what you do, what does it mean by strengthening exercises? 
So um, uh, at pulmonary rehab, we use a combination of strengthening and cardio. Um, we also focus on activities of daily living. So um, we, one of the exercises we do sit to stand, for instance. Um, so, I, I mean, I do think it's a big problem to get society back out to exercising. Um, and I absolutely agree with what William's saying about falls. Uh, you know, um, I mean, I just think of my dad, who's had three strokes uh, over a year ago and he's diabetic and his mobility has gone from 200 yards to 10, you know, it's really reduced. Um, and uh, obviously we do want to really encourage people to get out and, and exercise, um, but it is doing it safely. Um, so I think it's just, um, uh, you know, I say to, to people walk around, the house to start with if that's okay walk around the garden you know just gradually increase it walk with somebody so it's safer if you've got any walking aids use those particularly outside um but i think it's just encouraging them with whatever they're happy to do as well because if you say to them go for a walk and they don't enjoy that then they they probably won't um so it's trying to find out what they enjoy as well but you know they can exercise inside in preparation to exercise outside but it would always be a good goal to to try and get out lovely thank you Ruth. thank you william um ruth i'm going to come to you for the next question because uh, it focuses on on lung covid um do we have any sort of data at the moment on sort of the current numbers of people that have been diagnosed with with long covid and you know what's the scale of the, of the problem that we're seeing now or actually we might see going forwards as well? So uh, we have predicted um, values for those that have got long COVID. So um, it, it's, it's been considered that 10% of people who've had COVID will have long COVID. Then more recently, they're saying it might be up to 20%. So the numbers are massive. <laughs> Um, and uh, working across Mid and South Essex, I know the predicted um, number for March of last year for, for those who have long COVID is four and a half thousand in Mid and South Essex. So the numbers are massive. Um, and I don't know how really we're going to manage all those numbers. Um, but I, I hope that not everyone has really complicated symptoms of long COVID because obviously they're far more complicated to, to manage and uh, because I run the long COVID clinics they can come into the long COVID clinic and we assess them there and so far we've assessed um, probably about 30 patients and I'd say most of them have got three or more symptoms and they are really complicated. I'm assuming the ones that are less complicated so for instance if they've just got a symptom of pain, I'm assuming those might well be set, uh, treated by the GP and not referred into the long COVID clinic. So I'm hoping that all four and a half thousand for that month will not all need long COVID, the long COVID clinic and COVID rehab because uh, <laughs> I'm going to have to give up something like sleep. Yeah, I hope so too, Ruben. We know how important sleep is, having seen and listened to your presentation then. Um, and just quickly on, on that point as well, um, is the data being held centrally anywhere? You know, can anybody access it or is it that you, people need to, to go to a health professional to access the data on long COVID? Uh, the, the numbers that have had yes. it. Um, yeah, I don't know about that actually. William, you might know. Yeah, I don't know actually, and it's only just becoming a diagnosis you can make. Um, so you know, we'll probably have missed quite a few people to start with anyway. But um, but I don't know. I don't. I simply don't know. It's a very good question. No, okay. Well, we'll certainly go away, and we can do some research to find out um, where that data is being held. Um, I'm going to come to William for the next question, if that's okay. Um, and actually, it's a, it's a question that I was thinking about this morning for you both in terms of. Would we, would we be recommending all clients that have had COVID seek medical clearance before joining an exercise professional? No, because <laughs> I, 
I think we'll be totally inundated. So a huge number of people obviously have COVID, a massive spectrum from beginning to end. But and I think, as Ruth said, you can't quite predict who's going to get long COVID or not. Probably the more severe the symptoms, the more likely you're going to get long COVID, but it doesn't quite fit completely like that. And you get some people with fairly ordinary symptoms, you get long COVID, and some people have really severe symptoms and are absolutely fine. So it's a really strange thing. But no, I think if we did that, we would never see any other patient at all. <laughs> um, and But I think what you have to be aware of, the exercise professional has to be aware from what Ruth has said about those symptoms and signs and discussing with the patient. Um, and I think that it can be done there. Now, clearly, if there's a problem, a really severe problem, pain, for example, is coming through, or that patient is severely depressed, or they're really debilitated, and are hardly able to do it, then that, that extreme end, definitely, they may need to see some medical advice. But I think to have literally everybody who's had COVID, I think there's some discretion. And I'm not sure, Ruth, what your advice would be to the exercise professionals is to kind of in that kind of common sense type of thing, but also the ways that they could kind of pick out the ones that they feel are, are slightly problematic and actually would want to refer them back to primary care. Yeah, so um, bearing in mind uh, long COVID, it, it's, it's fairly easy to work out. In some respects, it's easy, other respects it's hard, but have they got symptoms at 12 weeks? And have they had COVID? So, so that will help you work out whether they've got long COVID or not. If they didn't have the test and you, you, you're still not sure, it, you know, it's unclear, but if they feel okay at 12 weeks, they have not got long, long COVID. And, uh, you know, most patients are okay at, at 12 weeks. It's, we're saying 10, maybe 20%. So everyone else who's recovered from COVID definitely should do exercise and, you know, um, that shouldn't be a problem. Um, although, there how obviously some people that do still have health problems from having had COVID. So you know, the, the likelihood of um, cardiac issues, that sort of thing is increased, um, et cetera. Um, but hopefully that would be diagnosed. Um, so the long COVID patients, I think they're just much more complicated. And I think they would be having some assistance or under some, some team like our team or, or a, consultant for their respiratory condition or something um, so they're unlikely to be um, not under anyone um, but for the long covid clinics they have all been set up across the country so if somebody's not under the, a long covid clinic who has long covid um, it should be easy enough for the gp to refer them brilliant thank you so much I'm going to squeeze one more question in because actually we've had some really great questions coming in and we're not going to have time for the webinar to answer them all, but we will make sure that um, we pose them to Ruth and to William and we will send out all of the responses after the webinar. Um, but we've had some questions coming in around children and young people. And this particular questions are asked around, have we had any research evidence recommendations about COVID recovery specifically for children and young people and if we have where could it where could we find this information I think that's the route ready <laughs> so um the long COVID clinic that I run does not take children <laughs> um but there are far fewer um obviously we know that that they're not um as unwell etc uh, as adults um so um i i'm not sure um where these the children are going because it's um because there are far fewer it was decided that there should be a specialist long covid uh, alternative for them over a bigger area so they're talking about having it across um the east east of England rather than having one like, like the one I run is mid and south Essex um, and I'm not even sure if it's actually um, started I suspect it's not because the last meeting I went to uh, they didn't seem to have started that long COVID clinic so I think there will be something set up but I don't think so at the moment um, and I'm not sure where to find out their information I presume it would be on the east of England um website nhs website um once it is set up 
I think I would just quickly add, I think if there was someone who felt that there was a child who had those symptoms of long COVID, the likelihood is they've probably got, they may well have some mental health problems as well underneath the anxiety and depression, which may be you know, also contributing, or they've got underlying health conditions anyway, um, which, and this has made, made it a lot worse. So I think they're gonna be more complex cases so I think as you, you know, ideally you, that's gonna need specialists, but probably first point of call, I would therefore recommend probably going to the GP first um, until the clinics are set up. And then I think it will be something that GPs will be able to refer on because they are complex and we are getting you know, a lot of children now who, who have very mild symptoms, but it seems to have an effect, particularly on the mental health. It seems to be the one where um, with everything wrapped around um, lockdown and the condition of the virus, I think that's going to be our biggest problem with the young people is that mental health problem. Um, therefore, I'd go for the GP bit for that. Brilliant. Thank you, William, and thank you, Ruth. Um, we're, we're now slightly over, so I'm, I'm very keen that we, we get away. Um, again, just want to say a big thank you, uh, William and Ruth, for your time this morning. It's, it's been really useful. Um, hopefully really informative. I am pleased to say that we've also uh, set up some additional dates for the, the next uh, couple of webinars as part of our Essex Health series, um, which we will be emailing out, hopefully in the next sort of 24 hours with some more information around that. Um, one final request is as we exit and leave the webinar today, um, there will be or should be a, a three question survey that will pop up on your screen. Please just complete that as we're hoping to use that to uh, help shape any future events. Um, so thank you for today. Hopefully it's been useful. Hopefully you've enjoyed it um, and hopefully we'll see you on the next one.